Hello everyone. Uh, up to this point, everything has proceeded according to my designs, and as a result, in this particular episode, we are now ready to talk about a subject called cookies. Previously, we discussed the fact that the web is a stateless system. You can go back to the previous episode if you want to review exactly what that means, but more or less what we discussed was that because the web is stateless, some extra abilities need to be present uh, in JavaScript in the browser in order for there to be a memory uh, that can be used to keep track of information as we move from page to page or as a, a client or a user moves from page to page. Previously we discussed URL parameters, uh, query strings, as being one of the uh, techniques that can be used for uh, supplying this memory, uh, being able to pass or remember information as the user goes from page to page. But as you may have noticed if you stopped and thought about query strings a little bit, they can be a little bit difficult to work with, especially in a very distributed uh, type system. They, they work very well for uh, small discrete pieces of information that simply need to be available uh, from one page to the next, maybe uh, multi-part forms or something like that. But anytime we have uh, information that needs to be available on sort of a more site-wide basis, query strings can become very, very difficult to work with. So what we can do instead, another technique of being able to keep track of information is that we can actually use these things called cookies. Now what a cookie basically is, is a small chunk of data that uh, JavaScript or other code on a server can request that a browser store. So traditionally cookies were actually small text files that were stored inside a browser, but nowadays the browsers tend to have sort of a little built-in database, which is where uh, what we call cookies are now typically stored. So more or less, uh, we visit a page on a website, the page on that website says, hey browser, make a cookie, and and as a result, the browser stores some information that the server requests internally, so it can then be made available to other pages on that site. To sort of lay this out so you can sort of see how it works, I have a client here on the left and a server on the right. The client, of course, would enter a URL, which is essentially sending a message to the server saying, give me a page. Uh, I want you to send me a page. The server then, of course, will turn around and send the page back to the client, and along with the actual page, either in the JavaScript or some other type of code, the server may also request that the client create a cookie. That cookie will have some piece of data in it that the server thinks is important, and will more or less use to sort of identify that client uh, in future requests. In response to the request to make a cookie, the browser should actually do so, assuming that the uh, ability to create cookies is actually turned on in the browser. This is always something that the user could turn off if they didn't like it. Um, the browser will actually make the cookie, and then every time there is a request to the same server, the same domain after that, the client saying, give me another page, it will also then send along a copy of any cookies that the server had previously asked it to make. This is something that only works between a client and a server. If a server asks a client to make a cookie, that client will only give that cookie back to that server, the server that requested its creation. So there's really nothing to be too paranoid about as far as cookies are concerned. If you go to one website and they ask you to enter your email address and that email address gets stored in a cookie, it doesn't mean that your browser is then going to send that cookie with your email address in it to every site that you visit from then on. That cookie that has your email address in it will only be sent back to the server where that cookie was originally requested to be created. Now cookies are a little bit complicated in a way in that they have six attributes that are very important to them, but in all honesty there's only three of these attributes that we actually use very regularly. The other three tend to be sort of special purpose attributes and we'll discuss what they do, but I don't suspect that you'll probably use them uh, as often as you just use cookies in general. The first attribute every cookie has is that every cookie has a name. The name of a cookie is how that cookie is actually identified. In JavaScript, when we make a cookie, we must give it a name. It's the only attribute that is required that simply has to be there. And in JavaScript, whenever we want to find the value of a cookie, we will typically look that up based on that cookie's name. Every cookie, or most cookies anyway, then are also probably going to have a value. The value is going to be just some value that we wanted to have stored in the cookie. It could literally be just about anything, although the actual size of the value stored in a cookie is uh, 
not infinite. It is limited. I don't usually bother to remember exactly what the limit is, as if you're because if you're using cookies correctly, chances are the data that you actually store in your cookies won't be all that extensive anyway. The name and the value of a cookie typically go together whenever you're creating a new, a new cookie. Uh, whenever we want to create a new cookie, the way we typically do it is we put together a string that has the cookie's name followed by an equal sign followed by that particular cookie's value. We then take that string and we assign it to an attribute or sort of a sub-object of the document object called cookie. So if we were to do something like this code here, document.cookie equals and then the string name equals value, what would happen is a new cookie would be created with that name that had stored inside of it whatever value we asked for. I wanted to point out here that document.cookie appears to be sort of a regular object or a regular variable, but it actually has some slightly unusual behavior. For example, if we created a variable x and we assigned the value of 5 to it, and then we took the variable x and we assigned the value of 9 to it, the 9 would of course replace the 5. Typical variables can only store one value at a time. Document.cookie doesn't really work that way. Document.cookie I think of as being sort of more like a doorway that we push information through, and we can keep pushing information through that doorway without replacing or without uh, uh, stopping the fact that we ever pushed anything through it previously. So if I set one cookie, uh, create one cookie string and push it into document.cookie, that basically is me telling the browser, make this cookie and give it a name, give it this name and this value. If I then say document.cookie equals and I put together a different cookie string, when that one goes through, it'll tell the browser, now make this cookie, and that doesn't replace any cookies that were created previously. Unless, of course, all of the cookies that I'm setting here have the same name. Every time I set a cookie with the same name as a cookie that's been created previously, what I'm actually doing is I'm replacing that previously created cookie. The second attribute of cookies that, uh, or I guess I actually the third attribute of cookies that you'll probably use fairly frequently is the expires attribute. The expires attribute actually has to do with how long a cookie actually sticks around. What you'll find is that there are basically two different types of cookies. There are what are called transient cookies and what are called permanent cookies. Transient cookies are the cookies that are created anytime you create a cookie and you do not set an expires date for it. If we created a cookie like we did on the previous slide where we simply set a name and a value for it, that would be a transient cookie. And the behavior you, that you'll see from transient cookies is that they will be created, but then they will also automatically be erased the next time the browser is closed. So if I create a transient cookie, it will generally stick around as long as the browser remains open. But as soon as the browser closes, that cookie will automatically be erased. It will be done away with. And the next time the browser is open, then of course that cookie will no longer be there. Uh, those are certainly the easiest kind of cookie to create because all they require is a name and a value. Nothing else has to be set for them. Permanent cookies, on the other hand, are cookies where the expires attribute is set. When we actually set the expires attribute, we do so by actually storing a date and time in the universal time format inside the expires attribute for a cookie. That uh, date and time that we store in the expires attribute should be some date and time in the future, typically. And what we're doing when we do that is we're asking the browser to try and keep that cookie around until that date and time is reached. With that kind of setup, when we have a cookie that has a name, a value, and an expires date and time in the future, the browser should, under ideal conditions, keep that cookie until that date and time is reached, regardless of whether the browser is opened and closed a million times or not. There are some, of course, situations where even permanent cookies can get wiped out. Uh, the user can, of course, manually always get, go in and delete individual cookies or clear out their entire cookie cache. There's also the possibility that if the browser is simply storing too many cookies, it might decide to start going in and deleting permanent cookies just to sort of maintain its own uh, working condition, which I, I think is probably a pretty fair thing to do. Now, whenever we use the expires attribute, as you probably guessed from what I was discussing before, we have to be able to set a date for it. And to set a date for it, we really need to understand a little bit about how JavaScript handles dates and times. So let's take a quick look at that now. 
JavaScript includes a date object, which actually makes it extremely simple to be able to work with dates and times within JavaScript. Just here is a quick example. Let me show you how we create a date object and what it contains. Inside the body of my document, uh, I could create a set of script tags, as we've done a million billion times before. And inside there, I could uh, perhaps create a new date object. What I think I'll do is I'll create a uh, variable. I'm going to call it now. And into that variable, I am going to put a new uh, date object, which would be created something like this. If I were to then do something like a document.write line and were to actually ask it to display for me the value of that date object, what we would find is that we end up with the full date and time of the date object's creation stored within it. So more or less what we have here in the date object is it's telling us that on Monday, uh, in, in my case August 31st, 2009, at 8.46 and 42 seconds in the morning, uh, five hours behind uh, Greenwich Mean Time and Central Daylight Time, a date object was created. So literally at the moment that this particular statement executes, uh, the date object comes into existence and automatically stored within it then is the date and time of that uh, th that it was at the moment that that thing was actually created. So if I go back to the browser and I actually hit refresh, of course it reloads the page, re-executes the JavaScript, and as a result I end up with a slightly different date and time in it. If I hit refresh again, you can see that it updates and we get a new date object each and every time. The date object itself is actually very very easy to work with. If I were to take my date object and maybe uh, uh, put it into a new variable, I'll call it uh, then, or maybe I think what I'll do is I'll create a new date object besides my now object, something like that. Okay? There are actually ways that we could uh, uh, manipulate the date object in a number of different ways. Uh, the date object itself actually contains quite a few methods. Uh, most all of them, of course, revolve around accessing or changing date and time. So, for example, if I were to do uh, document.writeLine uh, then dot uh, get minutes. Okay. What it would actually do for me in that case is it would retrieve just specifically the minutes from that particular date object. So in this case, that is what will then be printed out. So if I come back to my browser and take a look, the 48 that shows up over there is simply the minute part of the then date object. And over here you can see the now date object, which was created at almost exactly the same time, also has 48 for its minutes. So I can extract from a date object any individual part of the date or time using these different get methods. I can do things like get seconds, get minutes, get hours, get month, get day, get full year, lots of good things along that line. I can also then use a variety of different methods that all begin with the word set, which are more or less just like the get methods. The only difference being, of course, the set methods actually change the date. So if I were to do then.set minutes, and I were to tell it to set the minutes to, um, let's do one, right? then it'll actually go to that particular date object and reset its minutes value to whatever value I actually pass to the method here. So here when I set the minutes to one and then I get the minutes, one should of course be what comes back, and sure enough, one is what we actually get there for the minute of the uh, then object. This becomes really handy to us when we're using uh, cookies because cookies require that a uh, date and time be stored within them in the expires attribute whenever, um, whenever we want the uh, cookie to be a permanent cookie, a persistent cookie, one that will not uh, expire at the end of the session. The way this would uh, most normally be done, I'll go ahead and just use my uh, then object here as an example. The way this would very often be done is if we wanted to say, for example, set a cookie that was going to expire in, um, let's say, uh, three days, okay? What I could do is say then dot set um, hours to then dot get hours, okay? Uh, plus 24 or something like that. So I'm adding 24 to the current number of hours, which should then give me a date time that uh, a, a date object that has within it a uh, date and time that are 24 hours in the future. So down here then what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, just display the then object itself and let's take a look at it in the browser. 
So right now, the now object shows us it's August 31st at 8.50. The then object, which I've now added 24 hours to, says it's September 1st at the exact same time, so exactly 24 hours from now. So if I were to use the then object to set the expires date for a cookie, that cookie would be set to expire exactly 24 hours from the time it was created, from the time that the date object used in its expires attribute was created. The only last little trick that goes along with it then is that the default format that we get for the uh, date object here is not the format that cookies will allow. What I would actually need to do if I was using this in a cookie is I would need to call another method that's available in date objects called to UTC string. The to UTC string method actually you can see changes the format of the date object and this particular format that it puts it in is the exact format that cookies require for their expires attribute. So more or less the process would be whenever I want a cookie that's going to expire sometime in the future I simply create a date object like I've done here with the then object. I then take some attribute, some value stored within the, the then object, and I set it to some period of time in the future. Then I take the UTC string uh, format for that particular date object, and that's what I set for the expires attribute for my cookie. My cookie will then expire that far in the future. Uh, ideally, that's the way it should actually work. The reason that the UTC string is used is if you think about the internet, it sort of uh, transcend, transcends time zones in a lot of ways. The default format of the date object is always local to the time zone of whatever computer is uh, displaying it, basically. So since I'm in central daylight time here, my now cookie, which is being displayed with the default format, displays in central daylight time. But what if I'm not in the same time zone as the server that's feeding me this page, or the server that's requesting that a cookie be created? those time zones become a little bit meaningless or I suppose uh, just a bit of a hassle to have to deal with. So what's much simpler on the internet is to simply keep track of everything using Greenwich Mean Time, which they also call UTC time or Zulu time or world time or uh, lots of universal time, lots of names for it. But it's basically a time with no time zone. There's no time zone adjustment to it. It's simply Greenwich Mean Time. So. Um, uh, it'll vary, of course, a little bit from your uh, regular time, uh, unless, of course, you live in Greenwich or somewhere on the international date line. But uh, that is the way that it is typically done on the Internet. What I'd like to do next, then, doesn't actually have anything specifically to do with cookies, but it is a little example that will give us a little bit of practice playing with the date object. What I want to do in this example is I want to see if we can set up JavaScript to actually place a ticking clock, a, a clock that we can actually see time progressing on automatically, onto a page. To do this, what I'm actually going to do is down inside the body of my document, I'm going to put in a div and I'm going to give this div the ID of clock. That's actually going to be the div where I'm going to insert the current time every second. To be unobtrusive, what I'm going to do then is I'm going to put some script tags up in the head section, and in the head section I'm going to put together a window.onload event, so that will be a new function, so that once the entire page is loaded, this function will execute. Uh, we have to wait until the page is loaded, of course, so that that clock div will actually exist. What I'm going to do here inside this function first then is I'm going to create a uh, variable called clock div and into that variable I'm going to retrieve the div itself using get element by ID. There we go. Maybe I'll throw in an alert here real quick and uh, take a look and make sure clock div actually ended up there in my variable as I expect it to. Sure enough there's an HTML div element there so it looks like the retrieval of it went just fine. What I'm going to do next then is I'm going to create a variable called time and into that time variable I'm going to create a text node, just a bit of text basically, and what I want inside that text node is a new date. So we'll actually end up with the date and time stored there inside the text node. Then I'm simply going to append my time as a child to my clock div, something like that. So without having to insert uh, script tags into the body, without having to do a, a document.write line, I end up with the current time and date there inside my uh, div. Now, having a clicking, ticking clock on a page, that would probably look a little bit funny to have quite that much information. So maybe what I want to do is kind of uh, 
uh, parse that down a little bit so it's a little bit more appropriate. I think what I'll do here is I'm uh, going to make a variable called now and into the now variable where I'm actually going to place the uh, date object, sort of like I did in the previous example. Then when it comes time to actually make the uh, time, the text node time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, now, I'm going to get the current hours, I'm going to append to that a colon, then I will append to that now.getMinutes, then I'll append to that a colon, and then I will append to that now dot get seconds. All right, so I end up with just the hours, minutes, and seconds all strung together there into a string becoming a part of my text node. So if I take a look at it now, I end up with just that, huh, which looks a little bit odd. Everything, everything that's one digit is reduced down to one digit, so it would really help if we did a little bit of string formatting there, but I think I'll just leave it as it is for, uh, for right now anyway. Okay? Um, we can come back and fix that in a minute. So anyway, that actually gets my time displayed there on the page, even if it does look a little bit odd. Um, what I would want to do next then to actually get this thing to uh, tick is I would want to uh, set it up with some type of uh, timer. So in a previous episode, we actually talked about the uh, set, in set interval function, right? which is kind of in a way a bit of a loop in that it's going to uh, continuously call the same code over and over again. But what it's also going to do is it's going to call that code on a timer. So every so often it will call it. So what I could do here, for example, maybe is I could have it call a, a function that I'll write called tick. That function doesn't actually exist yet. And I could tell it to call that tick function every 1000 milliseconds, which means every one second, essentially. So then what I could do is I could create my tick function. Okay. And more or less what I'd want the tick function to do is generally go through the same steps I had done up here in document.onload. As a matter of fact, I could probably take most of this code that I had put up here in document.onload, I could instead move it down here to my tick function, and then up here in document.onload I could simply call the tick function to get all that done. So uh, here inside the tick function we're doing pretty much the exact same thing we had done before. We are retrieving our uh, div where our clock is going to be displayed, creating our date object, setting up the actual date and time to be displayed in it, and then appending it. So uh, that might even have been a little bit easier than I thought it was going to be. Let's go take a look and see if that works. Well, pretty close. You can see about the only thing I forgot was that we actually need to clear out the content of that div. Uh, what it keeps doing here is just appending the new time to what's already there. So it is progressing if you kind of watch the seconds there at the end. We just needed to wipe out everything that was there previously. So let me make one other function here. Uh, let's call it uh, uh, clear time. Okay. And what I'll do here is I'm going to retrieve my clock div again. I'm just going to copy and paste that. Right. Then I'm going to say while uh, clock div dot, uh, I always forget the name of this method, has uh, children, has child nodes. Let's try has child nodes. While clock, dot, while clock div has child nodes, then what we're going to do is we're going to do uh, uh, clock div dot uh, remove child, uh, clock div dot first child. Let's see what that does. Mm, didn't quite get it. All right, let's go back and give this another try. Oh, <laughs> I never actually call, called my function, did I? Uh, we want to do that in here somewhere. Let's call clear time. Let's see what that gives us. Hey, there we go, Eureka. Much, much, much better. So anyway, a uh, fairly simple little thing to do to uh, get something that appears to be a ticking clock showing up on the page. Uh, just to make sure you're uh, clear on what's happening, of course, is everything kind of kicks off from our window.onload function. The document completes loading. We then call the tick function. The tick function goes through, retrieves the clock div, sets up the date, 
clears anything that was in the clock div before and then appends the current time. What then happens is the uh, onload function sets up an interval so that the tick function is called again every one second in essence. So every one second whatever was currently in that div gets wiped out and is then replaced with a new the content of a new date object and since the date object reflects the time that it was actually created that new date object uh, being called one second later will be one second later and we end up with a uh, uh, a time that's one second in the future being displayed and the illusion that we actually have a ticking clock. Now that we've talked about dates and times in JavaScript, this little bit of code should make sense to you. What we're basically doing here is we're creating a new date object called exp for expires is what I was thinking. Uh, of course that new date object uh, starts off containing the uh, date and time of its creation and then what I do in the next statement uh, exp.setFullYear is I actually get the year that the expires uh, the expires date is currently set to I add one to it basically setting it to point to one year one year in the future one year from right now and then I set that as the year for the actual expires date so I end up with exp being a date object that points at one year from right now to actually set that expires date, we do document.cookie just like we did before when we were setting the name and the value. When we assign to document.cookie our cookie string, our cookie string does still have name equals value in it just like it did before, but we've now followed name equals value with a semicolon and a space. Whenever you assign multiple attributes to a cookie, you always separate those attributes with a semicolon and a space. So now name equals value semicolon space expires equals and then you can see here I've appended onto that the expires date that I created in the first two statements here uh, expressed in its UTC string format which is exactly what browsers want your expires date to be set in. So that will end up giving me a permanent cookie that will expire one year from today. The next attribute of cookies is called the secure attribute and it is relatively simple compared to some of the others. With the secure attribute we set it just like we would any other attribute. Secure equals true is the way we would actually assign it in this particular case. The way the secure attribute actually works or what it actually does is it informs the browser that that particular cookie should not be sent to the server unless it's over a secure connection. So anytime you store any kind of uh, sensitive information inside a cookie, you should always set the secure attribute for it to make sure that that cookie will never be sent in the clear. It'll only be sent over secure HTTP SSL type connections. Um, for example, if I uh, had a banking website and a customer logged into the secure part of the website to uh, to view their account and if for some reason which probably wouldn't be a very good idea I at that point on the secure part of the website stored that customers uh, account number and a cookie. I would definitely want to set secure equals true for that particular cookie. That way when the user maybe the next time they visit goes to the home page of the site, the home page of the bank site which is not secure, that cookie would not automatically be sent uh, because at that point of course it could potentially be intercepted and somebody could steal their account number. So anytime secure information is stored from a secure part of a website uh, make sure you set the secure attribute to true. The next attribute then of cookies is called the path attribute. Okay? The path attribute actually lets us override sort of a default behavior of cookies and that default behavior is that cookies will only be sent back to pages on a server when the page that's being requested is at the same level or below the page that initially asked the cookie to be created. So uh, that probably sounds a little bit confusing. So uh, here's a little example. Let's say in the root of the file system of my website, I have a home. I have a page called home.html, and below the root of the file system, I have a subfolder called gallery. And in that gallery subfolder, I have a page there called thumbs.html. Now, if for example the home.html pile, uh, <laughs> pile, the home.html file asked to have a cookie created, because that page is at the very top of my website, basically at the root of the file system in which my website is stored, the, any cookie that that page asked to be created will automatically be made available to all pages below it at the same level or below. So if the user goes to the home page and creates a cookie, when they then go to the thumbs page, the thumbs page will receive that cookie that the home page asked to have created. 
The opposite, however, is not true. If the user were to go to the thumbs page and the thumbs page asked the browser to make a cookie and then the user went back to the home page, the home page would not be given the cookie that the thumb page, thumbs page asked to have created because the thumbs page is below the home page in the file system hierarchy. Or at least that is the default behavior. With the path attribute, we can actually override that. Whenever we put in a path attribute for a cookie, what we can do is we can actually specify the path that cookie should be returned to. So if my thumbs page, for example, created a cookie and I wanted the thumbs cookie to be available to the home page, then when I created that cookie from the thumbs page, I could set path equal to slash, which basically tells the browser any page at the root of my uh, website or below should receive this cookie. And that, of course, is despite the fact that the cookie was not created at that level, it was actually created in a subfolder. Like I said, not something I suspect that you'll use too terribly often. The very last attribute of cookies then is the domain attribute, which is probably the one that you'll use least often. It's sort of very special purpose and it'll, uh, if you ever get to a situation where you actually need it, then I congratulate you. You must be doing really well. The way the domain attribute actually works, or what it's for, is if I have a client that sends in a request to a page to a server, here the server's called www and it's a part of domain.com, when that request is sent into domain.com, the www server answers it and sends a page back to the client, possibly telling the client to create a cookie. Of course, then if the client makes another request to the same domain, the same server will pick it up because in this situation it's the only server there, so of course when the client makes that request it will send that cookie into the server so everything will work just like we've been describing. But of course there is always the possibility that on a very large or complicated website there may be more than one server that is servicing that particular domain. So here for example if we say that domain.com has two web servers www1 and www2 uh, the situation gets a little bit more complicated. If the client makes a page request for a page from this domain, one of the two servers, we don't know which one necessarily, will service that request and send the page back to the client. And of course, it may at that point ask the client to create a cookie. If the cookie will, uh, the browser will of course then create the cookie, and then on a subsequent request, Okay. When that request goes back to the domain, if it is not the same server that the browser spoke to last time when it was asked to create the cookie, then the browser will not actually send the cookie along. So uh, imagine a situation, for example, where this is, let's just say your bank website again. The, the user in their browser goes to the bank website and www1 sends the login page back to the browser. The user then logs in the form submission goes back to www1. www1 sees that yes, it's a correct username and password. They then send back a cookie to the browser that says, okay, you're now logged in. Maybe then the user in the browser click on a, a secure page. They wanna look at their account balance. But maybe this time that request instead goes to www2 because www1 has gotten busy handling some other request. Well, even though that client is logged in according to www1 and has a cookie to show that it's logged in, because the browser is now talking to www2, it'll be like all of a sudden the user's not logged in anymore and they'll wonder what in the world is going on. Well, that's basically what the domain attribute is for. Anytime you have this kind of situation, you can use the domain attribute to basically tell the browser when it creates the cookie that it should make that cookie available to any server that is working in that particular domain. So here you can see in this code what I've done is I've included the domain attribute and what I've actually assigned to it is a dot followed by the complete domain name. What that will do is it will tell the browser any server that has .domain.com after the server name is an acceptable server to send the cookie to. So that would allow us to continue working in this sort of multi-server environment. Let's start off here by taking just a very simple uh, look at uh, creating and uh, retrieving cookie values. Uh, this is just going to be a silly little example, so I'm just going to go ahead and throw some script tags here into the body section of my document. And what I want to do here maybe first of all is just create a transient cookie. To do that, I'm going to go to document.cookie 
and I'm going to assign to document.cookie a cookie value. Uh, basically when I assign this here I need to put in a name, an equal sign, and then a value. So I'm going to call this uh, cookie1 for example and I'm going to give it a value of, I don't know, blue just as an example. If I go ahead and save that and then pull it up in my browser, uh, of course nothing actually appears on the page, but technically our cookie should be created at that point. I can confirm that my cookie was actually created by going into my browser settings. Uh, of course, depending on your browser and the version, you'll find these settings in different places. Once you get into the settings, again, depending on your browser and the version, you'll have to dig around a little bit, but you should find in there somewhere a place where you can actually view your cookies. If I go ahead and take a look at my cookies here, I can see that yes indeed a cookie does exist in my browser called cookie1 that has the contents of blue. That's actually its value. You'll also notice that it has no expires date, it has no security, no secure attribute set. It does have a path. All cookies have a path. Uh, if we don't set them, they get set automatically. So all of it is actually listed there. And of course over here in my particular browser what it does is it lists this as being a file cookie or file cookies meaning that it didn't really come from an actual website, it was actually from an HTML page that was loaded locally. So I can see that my statement, my JavaScript statement in my uh, text editor here did indeed work. I did actually create a cookie. So let me see now if I can create another cookie and what I want to do with this one is I want to create a cookie that uh, will not expire for a period of time, uh, a, a persistent or permanent cookie, whatever you'd like to call it. So to do that I'm actually going to start off by creating a expires date so uh, I'm going to create a new date object. I'm saving it here in a variable called expires. I think what I'll do for expires is I'm going to set its uh, minutes to whatever the current minutes are, exp.getMinutes, and then I'm going to add 5 to it so it will actually expire in 5 minutes. Uh, 5 minutes from the time it's created of course. Then I want to use that expires attribute to create another cookie. So document.cookie equals, I'm going to call this one cookie2 and I'm going to assign it the value of yellow. Then to actually put in the expires attribute what I'm going to do is uh, end my cookie value there with a semicolon and a space and then I'm going to put in expires equals and I will append to that my expires date formatted as a UTC string. So there we go, that should create a second cookie for me. Again, if I come back over to my browser and I hit refresh, I don't see anything, but if I go back into my settings again, look at my cookies, there's cookie 1 that was there before, still there, here's cookie 2 that's now been created, again path expires, uh, the expires date is actually there now for this one, which should be 5 minutes from, uh, from now, and it looks like everything's working just fine. So there we go, we can create permanent and transient cookies. The one other thing I might want to do is if I wanted to uh, display the cookies that I have, I could do something like a document.writeline and just display document.cookie. When I take a look at that in my browser, this is the way that the cookies are actually given back to me. You'll notice that all of the cookies that you have access to in your JavaScript are always returned as one long string. So it doesn't give me back cookie 1 and cookie 2 separately, instead they come back as one long string. So if I am in a situation where I'm dealing with more than one cookie, there's certainly going to be some parsing that I'm probably going to have to do there, very much like we did with the uh, URL parameters previously. You'll also notice that in the cookie string that's returned here, all it does is return the names and the values of the cookies. The second cookie, cookie2, had an expires attribute too, but all of the additional attributes, the expires, the path, the domain, the secure, those are not returned uh, whenever a cookie is uh, requested, like it's been sort of requested here. So it's simply the names and the values that we have to actually work with. All right. What I'm going to do next then is I'm actually going to uh, shut down my browser, Right? So I'm just looking at my code here. Here when I pull my browser back up, um, it's a little bit odd because my browser at this point is actually still giving me back my first cookie, my, uh, my transient cookie, which technically it shouldn't be at this point. If I had to guess, I would say it's probably something as a result of the fact that it's a local cookie instead of an actual cookie that's being loaded from a real website, which is making it behave a little bit uh, abnormally in a way. But generally in that case, when the browser has been shut down and then started back up again, the uh, transient cookie should not be returned. At that point, it should have actually been uh, wiped out. What I wanted to do next was to go back and look at an example we had done previously where cookies would actually be a benefit to us. 
In this particular case, uh, what I've gone back to is the font size changer example that we did. I believe when we were talking about URL parameters, uh, it actually looked like this in the browser, you might remember. Uh, what, how we had it set up was that we had three links for different size text up here in the upper right hand corner. Whenever we clicked on one of them, it would change all the text on that page to be that relative size. So the large link makes everything relatively larger. The medium link was about what we started off with and the small link makes everything relatively smaller. What I've actually done here for starters to uh, get this example going and to show you where cookies would be a benefit to us is I've actually set up four of pages that are basically identical to this and I've added a little bit of navigation here that lets us go to each one of those pages. So I have the home page which is page one, page two, page three, and page four. They all have basically the same file name just with a little number appended to the end uh, to make each of them unique. Now uh, when we had done this example previously the way we had actually set it up was that we had these three links that we had added to our code. Each one of them went back to the current page and passed a URL parameter uh, called size and a uh, actual uh, numeric size for the text to go along with that. So when we selected our small size, we set the size to 9. When we selected our large size, we set the size to 24. And on the medium size, we just didn't set anything at all. So when we had this working with URL parameters, the way that it actually functioned was that uh, when the page loaded here up in our JavaScript in the window.onload function, uh, we would actually check to see if there was a URL parameter passed. Right? If there was a URL parameter passed, then we would go through the steps of parsing that parameter. Uh, we remove the question mark. We split it on the equal sign. We then check to see if we had a size parameter, and if we did, what we would actually do is retrieve the page itself, the actual page element, which is a div that contains the entire rest of the page, and we would set the font size there to whatever value is contained inside the URL parameter. So whenever we click a link, it goes back to the current page, and in going back to the current page results in having the actual font size changed. That worked fine when we were dealing with a single page, just using URL parameters to do that. But if we go and we start having multiple pages, like I've set up here in this example, you'll see that the problem is, if I'm here on page 1 and I select the large size, when I go over to page 2, everything goes back to medium. It basically forgets that we had previously selected the large size. If I, here on the second page, I select small and then go back to the first page, for example, again, everything goes back to medium back to the default size. The reason it's doing that is these links that I've added for this particular example, which take us to each one of the four different pages that make up the example, uh, whenever we go to one of them, you can see that the URL parameter is not passed onto it. Uh, we certainly could set it up so that whenever we click one of these links, JavaScript remembers what the current size is and appends in that particular link, uh, or that particular URL parameter, so that when we go to another page, that page would then receive the same information and show the same font size that was selected previously. But you can imagine on a real website where we have quite a few different links that link to other parts of the site, that would become pretty complicated, having to go through and have JavaScript remember and append in a URL parameter so that that size would be retained. What will be relatively simpler would be instead of having uh, the size remembered as URL parameters, instead if we actually take whatever size is selected and store it in a cookie, we could then set up every page on the site quickly and easily to just, just look for that cookie, and if it finds that cookie, load whatever that particular size is. So that's more or less what we would want to do for this example. So what I'm actually going to start off with here in this example is I'm going to go ahead and get rid of the JavaScript that we had in here previously. Since we're not going to be working with URL parameters anymore, that's not really going to benefit us at all. Okay? And down here where I had my links that let me change my size, I'm certainly going to need to do something different with them as well. I think what I'm actually going to do for the size is I'm going to remove those links altogether. Just get rid of them and leave the uh, size uh, uh, URL or the size unordered list there simply empty. My idea then would be that if uh, whenever the page loads, we'll actually have JavaScript come in and produce those three links, and it'll produce them in such a way that whenever we uh, click on one of them, it will first set a cookie with the appropriate size, 
and then it will go ahead and redirect us to the other page the way that the link would normally function. Now, why not go ahead and hard code in the majority of the link and then simply add the JavaScript after the fact? Well, I think this way might end up being a little bit simpler. I also think that uh, another benefit of doing it this way is that um, if JavaScript is not enabled, of course the cookies aren't going to work. So if JavaScript isn't enabled, by actually adding those links with JavaScript, the user will end up just seeing a page basically like this. Still functional, still working, basically degrading gracefully, um, but without having to have any of the extra complication of explaining to user why there's a link up there that uh, doesn't seem to function for them because their JavaScript is disabled. So what I'm actually going to do here for the very first part of this uh, uh, process is up inside my window.onload function, I'm going to retrieve that size unordered list. So let me do var size div, uh, it should be an underscore, equals uh, document.getElementById. And I'm going to retrieve the thing that has the ID of size, which is that unordered list. Then what I want to do is I want to go through and actually uh, use JavaScript to add those three links and to set them up so that uh, when we click on them it creates the cookie and uh, puts the actual link into the page so that the user can click on them. So let me, uh, let's see, how do we want to do this? Okay, so let me now, um, I think what I'll do is I'm actually going to create another function. I'm going to call it add size link. And um, I think I'm going to set it up so that for the add size link, I pass it the actual size that I want it to add. I think uh, what might be easiest here is uh, basically I'm going to set it up so that I can call add size link. No, keep missing those underscores today. Uh, nine. There we go. Add size link twelve add size link 18, something along those lines. So these three calls to that function will end up creating my three links is sort of the idea. So down here in the add size link function, this is where I'm actually going to want to create the link itself. So I'm going to make myself a link variable and I'm going to do uh, document.create element and I'm going to create an A, an anchor tag. Right? For that link then, I am going to um, uh, let's see, I need to add some text for it and I need to actually set the URL for it as well. Uh, let's see, so let me pass two parameters to it. Let's pass the size and the name that I want it to be called, which means up here it's going to be 9, small, 12, medium, and 18 large, something like that. So I'm going to do link dot uh, href equals and I want it to link to the current page so I'm going to do a document dot location dot href that'll get the URL for the current page and then I'm going to append to that. Uh, do I need to append anything to that? Actually, you know, now that I think about it, I don't need the actual link part itself at all. So I'm going to um, just simply need to add an on click event for it. So let's just do a link dot on click equals and put a new function in here. Something like this. A space in there I don't like. So this is where I would actually then uh, create the cookie and at the end of it I'm going to return false so that it doesn't actually try to go anywhere. So here I simply wanted to create the cookie. Uh, oh, I also still need to add the text to it as well. Almost forgot that. So let me do var text equals uh, document dot create text node, and uh, the text node will be the name for that particular link. And then I'm going to do link dot append child text. There we go. And uh, as a matter of fact, maybe what I'll do right here is I'll put an alert in, um, clicked, I'll have it say, for the on click for the link. And let's just see what that gives us at that point. Oh, I just realized I created the link, but I never actually added it to the, uh, to the div. Let's have it uh, return the new link right there. And then I can come back and I can modify this and I'll do uh, size div dot append child. Ooh boy, typing is not good today. 
something like that. So the link that's created in the add size link function gets returned and that then gets passed to a pinned child. And I misspelled a pinned there, didn't I? There we go. So let me update my other two so that they do the same thing. There, and let's give that a try and see how that works. So there's my three links. Hmm, they don't have an href attribute right now, so they're not actually showing up as links, just as regular text. So back down here in my uh, add size link function again, let me do uh, link.href equals, and let's just set it to a pound. Since the onClick event returns false anyway, it's not actually gonna go anywhere, but that ought to at least get it to show up as a link. So this is the way it looks right now. Not especially attractive. My links are showing up as links at this point, but they are all jammed together. Part of the reason for that, I just realized, is that right now, um, what we're doing is we're putting text directly inside the UL, which is, of course, a no-no that's invalid. We actually need to have each one of these links that are being created put inside an LI, and then the LIs are what should actually then be added to the uh, size div. So down here in my add size link function, let me create a new variable LI, and let me do document.create create element LI. So I'll make an LI for each one of them. And then to that LI, I will append as a child uh, the actual link itself. And then instead of returning the link, let me return the li instead. And let's see how that works out. Hmm, didn't work out at all. All right, let's see if I have any errors. I sure do. Uh, I misspelled a pinned child, it looks like. Uh, A-P-P-E-N-D, let's see if that is any better. There we go. So now we have our link showing up again, very much like we had previously, but now JavaScript is what is actually putting them there instead of having them hard-coded into the HTML. So if JavaScript and cookies are turned off, those won't even appear, so users won't even know it's an option, but as long as they have JavaScript on, uh, those links will be there, and then hopefully cookies will also be enabled and they'll be able to use these links. So for those links then, whenever they are clicked, right now I have them set up so that they just will pop up an alert that says clicked, there we go, and they don't actually try to take us anywhere. So what I'll actually have it do at that point is I want it to actually create the cookie. So let me get rid of alert, <clears throat> and instead in here let's do uh, document.cookie equals. And let's go ahead and make this a transient cookie. I don't see any particular reason that it really needs to be permanent. Uh, let's call the cookie uh, font size. I'll just make it all lowercase font size. And then let me append to it the actual size itself, the size that was passed to this function. So that should result in a cookie being created. So let's go back to the browser and give it a try. I click the small link. If I now go take a look at my cookies, Sure enough, there's my font size cookie, and there's the size of it. Let me go try clicking on another one. Let me click large. Take a look at my cookies again. And the cookie that I had there previously called font size that had the size of 12 or 8 or 9 or whatever it was has now been replaced with the one that has 18. So it looks like the cookie is being created every time we click one of those links, just like we want. The next thing we would want to do then is we need to add a couple of new pieces of code to this example. Uh, one of them would need to be something that can actually uh, accept a size and based on that size change the font size of everything that's on the page. So that'll be sort of like what we had before with the URL parameters, or at least a, a small part of what we had before. The other thing we're going to need is we're going to need some code to add to each one of these pages that looks for that cookie when the page first loads. And if it finds it, then goes ahead and calls the first function I mentioned that actually changes the size. So let's do this first. Let's create a new function. Let's call it uh, change size, there we go. Uh, maybe change font size, just to be specific, in case we find we need to change the size of something else later. And let's uh, pass it the size. What we'll then do is let's retrieve the page element. Uh, element called page. And then for page, let's manipulate its CSS by doing page.style.fontsize and setting it to whatever size was passed to this page with pixels appended to the end of it. So we could go ahead and test this out right now. Whenever we create the cookie, uh, not only do we want to create the cookie, but we also want to go ahead and change the size right there so the user gets immediate feedback, can immediately see the new size that they've selected. 
So I'm going to, after I create the cookie, call my change font size function and pass it the size. And let's see what happens. Small, medium, and large. So it looks like that works real well. So then the other part that's left here is we need to uh, look for our font size cookie whenever the page loads. And if it finds it, go ahead and take the size that's available in that cookie and pass it to this function so everything happens. Uh, uh, it'll all happen immediately whenever the user goes to a new page. So let's um, add some new uh, code in here. Actually, I'm thinking maybe I'll add this code up at the top. This is code uh, that I can actually have happen before the page itself even loads. Well, nope, now that I think about it, I take that back. We can look for the cookie before the page is even done loading, but we can't actually change the size. So this would probably again be something that would be best to do uh, here inside our window.onload function. So uh, let's make a new function that we're going to call. We'll call it from right here. Uh, what should we call this particular function? What should we name it? Um, uh, do, 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 do. Let's say uh, set size from cookie. Like that. So then I need to actually create that function. The spelling function is not going to get me anywhere fast. Set size from cookie. There we go. So here what I want to do is I want to retrieve the cookie string. Um, I'll call it cookies equals document dot uh, cookie. Uh, I could have just used document dot cookie here, but I'm going to pull it out and put that value into a variable here called cookies just to make it a little bit easier to work with. And what document or what uh, cookies, what my cookies variable is going to end up with in there is something like uh, font size equals 12. It could potentially have other cookies in there like color equals red. So what I want to do is I want to make sure that there's something in there. I want to retrieve just the font size cookie uh, away from all other cookies that may also be there and then finally extract the actual size and set that particular size. So let me go ahead and start by uh, taking and separating all cookies from one another. Actually now that I think about it, let's start simply by making sure there is something. Let's say if cookies dot length is um, greater than zero, then we're going to go ahead and do the rest of this stuff. Uh, what I'm going to actually want to do here first then is I'm going to um, maybe recreate my cookies variable by doing a cookies dot split and I'm going to tell it to split the cookies on a semicolon and a space. So if there are multiple cookies like I wrote here in this comment, the semicolon and the space is going to become the separator. Each one of these is going to get split into a new element, so I'll have sort of the zeroth element and the number one element here. Right? Once they're actually split, I could then go into a for loop. Maybe I'll say for variable x equal to zero while x is less than the length of that cookies array. Increment x. And each time through the loop, what I'll want to do is take each one of these individual cookies and split it up so I can look at its name and potentially use its value. So I will say var um, uh, cookie parts, I'll name this variable, equals uh, cookies element x dot split. And this time I'm going to split it on an equal sign. So essentially at this point, I'll find the equal sign right here. Right. I'll use that as the point to split it and I'll end up with font size in one element and 12 in another. Something kind of like that. There we go. Um, <clears throat> so then I can say if uh, cookie parts element 0, which should be the cookie's name, if it's equal to font size, uh, font size, which means we found the font size cookie. Then what I want to do is I want to call my change font size function right down here and pass it cookie parts element one, which should be the actual size itself. Now hopefully that would about do the trick. So let me come back over, reload my page, small, medium, large. That all works. Okay, so the last link I clicked was large, which means there should currently be a cookie called font size that has the large size stored in it. So if I go over to one of my other pages, uh, it's not going to work because I haven't actually copied any of this code over to those other pages yet. So let me do that real quick. I think what I'll actually do here is I think I'm actually going to take most of this code um, how much of it do I want to take? I'm certainly going to take all of these. Whoa, whoa, 
all of these functions. There we go. I took out everything except for the window.onload. Right. And I am going to put that stuff over in a new file. I'm going to save this new file in the same location where I have everything else saved on my desktop. I'm going to save it at, as um, font size changer dot js. This is my font size changer code. So there we go. I'll save that right there. Then in each one of my pages, oops, can't do it there. I'm going to need to import that. There we go. Font size changer.js. So that gets imported. Now in each one of my individual pages, then what I'm going to want to do is have this basic exact same setup. So I'm going to copy all my JavaScript from page one over on page two, then I'm going to drop it in replacing the old URL parameter code that I had in there. Page three, same thing. There we go. And finally, page four. There. Now let's see how everything works. Oh my goodness, where are we now? That's interesting. Okay, we're on page two. Let me go back over to page one. Okay, so on page one, everything looks just great. I can do small, medium, large. If I go over to page two now, everything is still large. That's the most important thing. It looks like my links up here are doubled up. The reason for that is that on all the pages except one, I never went back and removed the old URL parameter links. So let me just yank those out of all my other pages. There we go. And that's what we end up with. So on the home page, I pick a size, small, go to any other page on the site. That page looks for the cookie, finds it, and loads that as the default size. If I change to a different size, large now, go to a different page, okay? it remembers. So it looks like that's working just fine. We've got our uh, page size, our relative text size being stored now in a cookie. When it's stored in a cookie, it makes it very easy for each one of the individual pages to be able to access it. So I don't have to worry about passing complicated parameters back and forth from one page to another. This example, of course, did get a little bit complicated, but if you think about it, it took us all of about two seconds to handle the actual cookie portion of it. The complicated part was really sort of all the setup that went around it. So that seems to have all worked out uh, very, very well, and I can't think of anything else we can do to this one, so we will call it finished.